when we published the Global Commission report, we emphasised that we were not doing this simply for economic reasons. The argument that was put to us all the way along with the Global Commission and indeed with the Inequalities Review in England was that nobody would take you seriously unless you could say that there were good, hard-headed economic reasons for doing this. And I dug my heels in and said, the reason we're doing what we're doing is one of social justice. There are good, solid, ethical reasons. Health inequalities that are judged to be avoidable are wrong, unfair. If avoidable by practical means, putting them right is a matter of social justice. With the Global Commission, we put at the centre empowerment. Material, psychosocial, political, having voice. One of the comments that I've had all the way through, both with the Global Commission and with the English Review, is where is personal responsibility in all this? <coughs> and my answer is personal responsibility is right at the heart of it. But we have to create the conditions for people to take control of their own lives. The freedom to control your life is not, doesn't just happen those freedoms are distributed unequally in society and we have to create the conditions for people to take control of their own lives. There is a headline that health inequalities have not narrowed and that leads to a certain wringing of hands and depression. We've had a Labour government since 1997 how come health inequalities didn't get narrower? Well, the headline that health inequalities didn't narrow is only part of the picture. And you can see that health, here measured as life expectancy, improved for everybody. In fact, since we've been monitoring over the last 10 years, the so-called spearhead group, which is about the bottom quarter, life expectancy for the spearhead group improved for men by 2.9 years in only 10 years. That's absolutely dramatic. The worst off had a dramatic improvement in their health over a 10 year period. Absolutely dramatic. I don't know who did it, but we can all pat ourselves on the back and say this is a great societal achievement. And I'm emphasizing that because we have to remember things can change really, really rapidly. And the worst off had this dramatic improvement. The problem is the average improved. That's not a problem. That's great. But the average improved slightly more rapidly than the worst off did. So the gap got slightly bigger. Now, if we can get such rapid changes, then potentially we can reduce inequalities. Great achievement, much still to do. I've spent my academic life doing research on the social gradient. That health inequalities are not confined simply to the poor health of the poor, important as that is. This in a way is the signature tune of my review. Each of these dots represents a small area of the country and they're classified by deprivation, neighborhood income deprivation. The top graph represents life expectancy and you can see the social gradient. Can't point, but you can see people near the top have shorter life expectancy than those at the very top. People in the middle have shorter life expectancy than those at the top people near the bottom have better than those at the very bottom. If we compared the 5th with the 95th centile, it's a seven year gap in life expectancy. The bottom curve shows disability free life expectancy. You can see that the gradient is much steeper. The gap between the 5th and the 95th centile is now not seven years, but 17 years. 
which means that people at the top are spending 12 years of their lives with disability and people at the bottom, albeit having shorter lives, are spending 20 years of those lives with disability. Now, we put a green line there, the top of which is at 68. The government, for good, hard-headed economic reasons, wants people to stay in the workforce longer, wants to advance retirement age to 68. So this is the economic argument. If retirement age today were 68, three quarters of the population at least do not have disability-free life expectancy as long as 68. If having disability meant you're on disability benefits, the effect of prolonging retirement age to 68 would be to move people off pensions onto disability benefits. That does not save much money, nor is it very good for people with disability. Now, if you want simply to have the economic argument and you ask, how can we re reduce that 20 years with disability that people at the bottom are suffering or the 15 years people in the middle are suffering? Easy. Hand out free cigarettes. What, you say? Well, of course we don't have a narrow economic argument. We have a moral argument. You wouldn't do what was simply right for economic reasons. You do what's right for moral reasons. Now, if you want an economic argument, read the review, it's in there. But I emphasize that's not why we're doing what we're doing. Nevertheless, here's the argument. If you think that health inequalities are mainly about the poor health of those at the bottom, you could ask, well, what if we could get the health of those at the bottom up to the average? We're doing it a different way. We're saying everybody below the top could conceivably have the good health of those at the top. So each year, if everyone in society had the mortality rate of those with university education, we would prevent 202,000 people dying prematurely, age 30 and above, each year. And because of that, and that's 40% of deaths, and those premature deaths add up to 2.5 million life years gained. Now, if I were some sort of accountant and I wanted to put pounds sterling on each of those life years, it would be telephone numbers. So the economic cost of doing nothing is ginormous. We cannot afford to do nothing. And that means that plea like, well, you're reporting into an, an adverse economic climate. Yeah, I've heard that argument. But this is the argument for taking action. 